A Gulf War veteran who moved to Colorado last year has had his children confiscated by the state of Kansas over his use of marijuana. Now, this is 40-year-old Raymond Schwab, and he relied on medical marijuana to treat PTSD after he suffered severe side effects from medicines that were prescribed to him by the VA. Now, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, prescribes Schwab with an assortment of medicines like they tend to do, including anti-anxiety drugs, muscle relaxants, and pain medicines. Uh, but he said they did not work well for him. In fact, they made his condition a lot worse and so he found that it was medical marijuana that was the only thing that helped and in fact now that is the only thing that he relies on to treat his pain as well as his PTSD. Well, nine months ago, he and his wife planned to move to Colorado in order to start growing medicinal marijuana to help other veterans. And right as they were preparing for this move, the state of Kansas took five of their children, ages five to 16, into custody on suspicion of child endangerment. So it's been nine months now. A judge uh, declared that the claims of child endangerment were unsubstantiated, but the children have not been returned to the Schwabs. And they're now asking how the state is able to keep their kids and keep them in custody even after the charges against them have been dismissed. So joining me now are Raymond and Amelia Schwab from the steps of the Capitol building there in Kansas. Now talk to me a little bit about this federal lawsuit that's just recently been filed. I know that was actually what compelled you to end a 17 day hunger strike. So where do we stand now with this case? Right, well, at the, uh, the reason I ended, as you said, is because one of my conditions to end was um, a higher authority to step in. So an attorney out of California named Matthew Pappas uh, flew out here and uh, helped me initially file it pro se. Um, we've added close to 27 or more uh, defendants uh, to the complaint. Uh, we just recently found out that the federal court is allowing us to file. And the uh, amazing thing is because it's pro se, all of these individuals are going to be served by U.S. Marshals. I would love to be able to see their faces when they get those documents. But um, yeah, we're just pushing forward. Uh, Matthew is trying to get uh, aligned with the attorney we have that's local uh, because uh, that way he can come into the lawsuit. But eventually he's going to fully take it over. And uh, we're definitely seeking full accountability under the law for what they've done to my family. Right. And you're definitely not the exception here. You have been uh a lot of families have actually been coming out of the woodwork, people who are afraid to speak out because of the bullying, because they have other children at home that they're afraid if they do speak out that perhaps uh, the child family services is going to come in and take the other kids out of the home. So they're just quiet and allow themselves to be bullied by this system that is destroying families. Now, I know that you guys are one of the things that is uh, making this such a big uh, impact here with this case is that you were kind of dealing with the cross street st state line. So in Colorado, uh, where you are living, where you were about to move to, um, marijuana is legalized there, uh, even for recreational use, but you all were using it um, there medically. And then of course, in Kansas, they said, well, we don't agree with that here. And so uh, just in the instance of this state, just to note how the tensions are really high between these neighboring states with Colorado, uh, sheriffs from, from Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Kansas all filed a lawsuit against the state of Colorado for these marijuana laws. They cite trafficking concerns. Um, so it's almost as if they're using you as an example to to, t to let Colorado and other states that would pass this legislation know that, well, we have the power here and we're gonna hold our thumb down on these families that would dare not follow their rules. Yeah, and I said the same thing from the beginning. When I got a copy of the police report, it they had a snapshot from my Facebook where I said that we were moving back home to uh, get uh, involved in a dispensary and start working with veterans, help get them off medication. Uh, through the use of cannabis oil because we have record numbers of veterans overdosing on prescription drugs and so they actually snapshotted that and put it in the file as part of the reason why they were taking our kids and um, you know as we travel back and forth we've had car rental agencies say that we have to be careful because they're actually targeting any kind of fleet Colorado license plates when they cross the border and even since we've been here on the Capitol you know I've been to a, a congressional or a a committee hearing here um, against a really bad bill they were trying to pass, a hemp oil bill they called it. And uh, the facts and statistics they give concerning cannabis 
uh, are complete. It's like watching an episode of Reefer Madness. <laughs> Some of the things they're saying, it's crazy. I mean, it's total propaganda. Right. Well, it's, they're they're absolutely ignorant to its beneficial uses, and especially with veterans, because they're not actually doing any long-term studies on the benefits of medicinal marijuana. Meanwhile, they'll put the veterans on 30 different type of psychotropic drugs that are probably going to have a lot of adverse reactions with each other, and that's completely fine. These prescription drugs that actually kill more people than heroin or cocaine or something, if you were just to buy the drug right off the street, you'd have a better chance of surviving than you would if you got put on these legal prescriptions. So that's why I find it so infuriating. But something else that's going on here with this case, which many, many families are actually dealing with, um, is this Kids for Cash. Now, you mentioned earlier when we spoke on the phone that Kansas was actually one of the first states, or this might have been Miko, but was one of the first states that actually privatized this idea of getting money from taking kids from their families and then fostering them out. So talk to me a little bit about what, what's happening in your case. Well, what's ironic is I believe that privatization was the result of an ACLU lawsuit because Kansas was doing a poor job and kids were dying and being abused. So that was like a penalty. But then these businesses came in, like we have one here, it's called St. Francis. They have a hospital where they report parents and kidnap children. They have an adoption agency, and they also have volunteer caseworkers that are called children's advocates that actually work with the children. So they're involved from A to Z of this child kidnapping and then selling them out. If you go to their websites and DCF websites for Kansas, it's almost like looking at a puppy shopping bazaar mm. uh, online because they have these kids with these little bios and they're smiling and how great they would be to be adopted out. It's really, really sad and disgusting because as we've had people come up here and just share their cases, it's just happening over and over and over. And I believe last year, um, and I, I'm not uh, sure if this is a completely accurate statistic, but Kansas uh, made something like 17 Point five million. That's just the state in federal bonuses for placing kids outside of their kinship structure. But that doesn't include the social work or the uh, private social workers or the case managers or the psychologists that put these kids on drugs or the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, the tentacles just stretch all over the place. Right, and they're putting it out there as as this great thing that they're doing by saving all of these children. Meanwhile, there's another case where a child was known. There was absolute signs of abuse and this child actually uh, a four-year-old ended up dying because it neglected and so you're seeing in a lot of these instances um, that they're taking children that are quote unquote more adoptable or more you know easier to foster whereas the other maybe trouble kids the trouble cases they just kind of look away ignore them and then they end up being killed this happens all the time just to put up on the screen for people to see how much they're making uh, they're getting bonus they get a referral rate, almost $4,000 um, there in referrals, just, you know, something like that. If they, $5,000, if they place them somewhere, uh, $7,500 for children 9 to 13, $10,000 per placement for children 14 and older. So this is a huge racket. I mean, they are making money. And especially when you consider kids that get lost in the system, so they're not adopted out. They're just locked up in the system constantly people make their entire year's revenue off of fostering children they do and i think my wife know more about this what how much is it for a native american child that you heard you don't remember i think it was something like uh 25 000 if it's a native american child because they're under a different federal structure but if the tribe doesn't step in they actually get more money for destroying indian families now i don't i haven't 100 percent verified that but it, it it's consistent with the pattern that we've seen that, you know, they have high value targets that they go after. And if they don't have, you know, like damaged kids that are on medication, then they make them damaged and put them on medication. My son is currently in a psychiatric institute. Uh, he is not mentally ill. Uh, they did it because my wife refused to authorize them, putting him on basically legal methamphetamine. Right. And well, Raymond, hold that thought because I actually want to, after the break, I want to finish up with you so we can talk a little bit about what's actually happening to your children now that they're in protective custody. And I also want you to let parents out there know what they can do if they're dealing with this as well. So stick around. We'll be right back.
the... they even had the children believe that I was like in a hospital because I was sick when my first when they were first taken. Because my daughter life. was like, "Are you okay, mom? Are you well?" And my wife was like, "Yeah, I'm fine." She we heard her say to someone, "Okay, my mom's better. I'm going home now." It's just and sad. they said it, that it was a, just a good way to explain to a young child. Yeah, that she's sick, and that's why she's not coming for you, really. So what sort of thing has been happening with your children uh, that you're aware of? Because I, I understand you've only been able to see them twice in the last um, more than a year now? No, it's been more than that, about six times. Okay. Uh, but not a lot. Um, you know, we have to travel 600 miles to do it, and it costs a lot of money uh, to travel and stay here. Um, plus, they were just doing all these intrusions into our privacy to try to force us into complying with them or not see our kids. And then so. the kids would show up late and they wouldn't rearrange it so that we could still have our time. They just cut it short. Yeah, yeah. one visit, they were 45 minutes late. We got 15 minutes with our daughter, with, which broke her heart. You know, she was like, where are you going, mom and dad? I just got here. And uh, they were like, well, we'll make it up next time. And we were like, we just drove 600 miles. You know, you're not helping us pay for this. So. Um, but we are um, having a visit on Tuesday. Uh, my son gets to come for the first time in a year. They've been retaliating against him for uh, testifying on our behalf that the allegations were false. Couldn't even get a supervised phone call with them. And uh, now he finally gets a visit. But that's why he's joined our federal, federal lawsuit because of uh, what they've put him through. And so just tell me a little bit briefly what sort of hoops they wanted you all to jump through so families can understand because a lot of times what happens is, um, you know, if you've got nothing to hide, you're just going to open your door to Child Protective Services, not understanding that they are building a case against you from the very minute that they step across that threshold. And so then in order to appear as if they're complying with you, we're gonna give you your kids back. They say, but we just need you to do all this first. So you guys are in Colorado and you're having to do all this stuff to comply with Kansas state law. So just give us briefly a little bit of a... Sure, sure. So. Yeah, they really set you up for failure, I think. I had 23 things just on my case plan alone. Um, they knew that I didn't have a vehicle. My husband was working in Denver and I didn't have a vehicle or we didn't get a service up at where we live so it was really impossible for me to do the things that they were asking to do for one but when you're so overwhelmed with grief because you just lost your children that's really overwhelming to see that you have to do so many things but even when you do them they'll, they don't care they're, they're not going to give them back anyway and they'll twist them because you have to do like they asked us to do mental health evaluations drug and alcohol evaluations parenting class because i'm a man i had to do a domestic violence abuser intervention course, which I protest, I didn't even have domestic violence right. uh, mentioned in this case. So it was just nutty, all the things they were just putting on us. But see, people, all those classes get paid, the mental health people get paid, but then they're doing worse things because we've met people this has happened to. You'll do the mental health evaluation. They'll say, well, we think you're bipolar, so you're going to have to take this medication. And if you refuse, they'll say you're not complying with your plan and they will try to terminate your rights. So they're actually forced medicating parents and children mm -hmm. which we all know about psychotropics how terrible they are so it's really just a war against the family by yeah. government agency well absolutely and talk to me a little bit about what is going on with your children now because i know that was one of the big issues that they are wanting to force medicate Yeah, um, one of our children, we found out, because we told them in the beginning, you better not put them on psychotropic drugs. We haven't lost our parental rights. And they rights. did anyway, by the way, for a time until we caught it. Yeah, and then we caught it. When I became my own attorney and asked for discovery, they knew I was going to see all the records. And they said, oh, you didn't know we've had him on, on this legal methamphetamine for weeks, and we're taking him off right now. But then they called a conference where my wife was talking to the psychologist at the school, and they're like, well, we really need to put him on this. And she said, absolutely not. I've homeschooled him his whole life. I know how what natural remedies you guys can use if you're just gonna take the time to do it right. And so they created this dynamic against him where they said he was having troubled behavior, which even if he was, I mean, he just got kidnapped from his parents. Yeah, what's he gonna be, a sweet little angel? I mean. Right, and so because of that, he has been locked in a psychiatric uh, institute for two weeks now. We found out, got an email saying he got assaulted and punched in the face, this sweet little homeschool boy. 
And uh, they said, but it's okay, he got new glasses. Mm. That's how detached from reality. It's okay, your son got assaulted, but we got him new glasses. And I just don't understand how these people get up every day and, and, and live with what they're doing to these children. No, it's really completely frightening. Now, I want to put up your GoFundMe page. I know you guys have been trying to raise funds uh, to just help with this entire situation. As you mentioned, you guys have been having to go back and forth 600 miles uh, to try to jump through the hoops that they that they give you um, to complete all the different courses and things like that. But I also wanted to draw attention to another website that you have uh, created to help other families that are having to deal with this same type of, of problem and sort of steps that they can take. So talk to me a little bit about that. Sure, we just started a, a blog. It's called Free Our Children, the Parent Underground for Combating DCF Child Trafficking, where we're trying to connect groups. We found there are a lot of groups, but they're very disconnected. And we wanted to connect them where parents, because our phones are blown up all day long, emails all day long, where we can have just a source for them to go to where they can get some legal tips, to talk about pro se, um, representation of yourself, what to watch for, what to do when DCF ants, you know, comes to your door, where when they're calling our phone, we can say, go to this website first, see if there's activists in your state, and just connect parents to real advocates, because a lot of these advocacy groups out there actually receive state funding, and they're like Trojan horses. They say, oh, we're here to help you, and then they report on you and help get your kids kidnapped. We want an actual advocacy hub where people from all over the country can connect and even around the world and share their stories and connect and get resources that we can put an end to this kids for cash cartel. Right, people need to understand that this is absolutely going on. When we've reported on the prisons for profit, people didn't believe that was happening, didn't believe that it was the prosecutors and the attorneys and the, the judges who actually own these prisons who are now deciding that you need to go to jail. It's the same thing with this Kids for Cash program. It's these agencies coming in and just arbitrarily taking children away from their homes and their families and then keeping them, battering them back and forth throughout the system so that they don't get adopted, they don't get put anywhere that's safe, neglected while they're in these foster homes. Um, a lot of cases where children are being assaulted, terrible things happening, and there's no accountability there. And you, as people who are just trying to do the right thing and trying to comply, trying to jump through the hoops, are being treated like the criminal element here and having yourselves be destroyed in the media. Um, just a lot of the articles that they try to put out about you to try to, you know, paint you as this unfit parenting when obviously, you know, you guys have been on, there on the Capitol steps. I mean, doesn't seem like people who have abandoned their kids. Yeah, we've been here almost 34 days now, actually. The hunger strike was for 17, but once we've seen all these families coming up here and saying, you have given us hope, you've given us strength, we didn't know you could fight these people, we're terrified of them, um, we thought we're gonna stay. We're not going home just because we have a lawsuit. We're gonna stay up here and continue to give people hope that you can fight, and we're gonna fight the state from the steps of the state capitol. You can't get any more classic than that. It's Until a beautiful thing. Until we get our kids back or end up in jail. Yeah, or stuff. I mean, <laughs> we want to see some conclusion to this before we voluntarily depart from this because it's really drawn a lot of families out of hiding, uh, saying, we, we want your help. And can you tell us how you did this? And they're watching our videos and, and newscasts like this and, uh, you know, figuring out that, hey, we can stand up against these bullies. Uh, we just have to know our rights and have the courage to do it. Right, absolutely. Well, Raymond and Amelia, thank you guys so much for sharing your story. Um, everybody out there, go to the GoFundMe page, help this family out. They are standing up for your, your rights as well as the rights of their own family. And, uh, you know, it really is time to take our kids back. And this is a war on the family because they're going to be coming after all of you single mothers out there, any of you uh, families that are going through a divorce and, you know, perhaps you're having a little bit of issues with, you know, with your own relationship. Well, that could be a a case for them to come take your kids. You know, people out there who have disabilities, they could be snatching your kids from you, saying that you're unfit. Meanwhile, they are raking in the dough for breaking up homes. So you all, thank you so much for joining us and we'll be speaking with you soon.